Hey, everybody. This is the she no. Just kidding. Hey, everybody. It's the She's the Owner podcast. I'm your host, Kara McCarran, and welcome to the show. If you're watching this, it's not my usual uh, studio setup. There's a beautiful blank wall behind us and this beautiful lady right here, Deborah Lynn Houghton of Picture Perfect Cleaning. So what are we talking about today? I haven't had anybody on the show in a little bit. And usually when, when I have somebody on the show, we talk about their business. We talk about, um, masculine, feminine energy. We'll talk about mindset. Yep. And also there's some children nearby. So if you hear them, that's just how it's going to be. And three dogs, three kids and three dogs. So we're going to talk about Debbie's business. We're going to talk a bit about our friendship. We're going to talk about whatever else comes up. So hi, Debbie, come over to the microphone. Okay, we have to share a microphone on this one. Okay. Um, so welcome to the show. Thank you Thanks for having for coming me. On. I'm so excited. Um, have you ever done a podcast before? Never. No, you should probably get addicted to it because it's a lot of fun. Um, and it's super casual. So don't get too work worked up about, it doesn't have to sound perfect. If you've listened to any of my podcasts, they sound like a fucking gong show most of the time. So tell us a bit about your business. Start there. Why you started it, what you love about it, what you hate about it, what you do. We'll just go from there. Okay. Um, I started a cleaning business, Picture Perfect Cleaning Services, five years ago. And the reason why I started it was because I was tired of working for somebody and I wanted to work for myself. Um, and I thought about um the overhead costs and stuff like that. And I and what would kind of be therapeutic to me. And I thought of cleaning because when I'm angry or upset, I like to clean and it is again, therapeutic. So I went with trying to start a little cleaning business, which took off right away, surprisingly. And I felt that I bit off a little bit more than I could chew just by knowing a few people and them knowing a few people. And yeah, that's how it started. And that's how I'm here. So we're gonna have to kind of move the mic back and forth so you get a good sound. But so, and I think that's like one of the things that I think is really interesting about women in business in general is that we tend to gravitate toward doing the thing that we're good at. And sometimes we omit the things that we really love in favor of doing the thing that we're really good at. And it, that's not to say that what, you know, like if you like cleaning, you like cleaning, but on the same token, getting into that place where we feel fulfilled and we feel joy and we feel like a lot of excitement around the thing can be a bit tricky. Um, talk a bit about, maybe talk a bit about your, like sort of how you got, cause when you said at the, at the top, um, you didn't want to work for somebody else. I think anybody who listens to, to this <laughs> podcast can 1000% relate. Like Agreed. I make jokes all the time. Like I would get fired in a hot minute now, especially now, like after, owning the content company for eight years and then love soldiers brand and then going into real estate. There's no fucking way I would, I like a day. I mean, and I think I'm being generous by mm -hmm. saying one day and I'd be like asked to leave and not return the or following quit. day. Or yeah. Or I, um, I'd probably just walk out. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the most important things too, about that is not feeling, cause I think early on when I started realizing I was an entrepreneur and I couldn't work for anybody else, I felt a way about it. Like, I thought there was something wrong with me. I thought, holy mm -hmm. fuck, like, why can't, like, I'd see all my friends go to university and they're getting all these like accounting jobs and even in like more proper marketing jobs. And I've always been in sales and marketing, but not like a official marketing role. It's always been some type of sale, sales job. And so I always thought fundamentally, there's something wrong with me. Like, why don't I want to do that, that mm -hmm. everybody else is doing? And so talk a bit about, because you made the statement you would you couldn't work for somebody else talk a bit about like the journey up to the point where you were like hey I need to really do this myself now and not just um work for other people because that's that's a hard leap for most especially mm -hmm. for most women because so many women now are in positions in their household where they're earning the money and, yeah. and it's not super easy easy to just peace out and go I'm gonna go do my own thing now. right so talk a bit about that journey like how you ended up being like hey Actually, no, I can't work for other people now. Well, I mean, it starts from when I was 14 and I got my first job. But I, so I just, as as I got older, I started working for 
a Manulife Financial, an insurance company. And then after Manulife Financial, I started, I had little jobs throughout and, um, but that was like my big like job, career. career. Yeah. Um, but then after that, I left and I went to um, Foresters, which is another insurance company. And just in between the two of them, I had many different um, jobs similar to them. Um, but my biggest thing was the travel and because I worked downtown Toronto mm -hmm. and the, the travel every single day was like I felt robotic and I, it was like two hours there, two hours back working an eight hour shift. So basically you're doing a 12 hours out of the day. Yeah. And I remember some mornings going into work, I'd cry my way into work and I'd probably cry my way home. And this is well before kids even came into play. So I was thinking like, something's got to give, like, I can't, I don't, I can't live like this. Like it was just so exhausting. And, and then I didn't want to do the job. So it was just, I doing the job to get the money. Right to get paid, but I just wasn't, and I know not everybody wakes up and loves what they do. No, half the world doesn't, they do it because they have to. So or they I get, do it because they think they have to. They, they, yes, exactly. Yeah. Because they think they have to. So then after that, I was like, I'm done with the office. And I dabbled in a couple of things outside of that. And part of it, some of it, like bar, I went into bartending and I did like that, but the nightlife got exhausting. And then you have to wind down. You're not, you don't fall asleep until you're it's four o'clock in the morning. And then it just caught up with me too. It was really tiring too. I did like that, but I, I was like, yeah, I can't do this for the rest of my life. And then I had kids. So then at that point, I think that's when it was really triggering in my head. Like, so am I going to go back to the office job and it, the redundancy and, going in as a robot. That's how I felt. And I was just like, I just thinking about it would give me anxiety. So I was like, in my head, I'm like, I need to come up with something, something that I will wake up every morning and just be like, it's not that I love to do it, but it's something that I can get through and be okay with doing. And that's where I came up with the cleaning business. My friend also, I have to give credit where credit is due. He kind of kicked me in my ass and gave me a little nudge and sat on the phone with me in a parking lot for about, I don't know, an hour and a half. And we discussed like what I could do, what, where, where there wasn't more, like there wasn't too much overhead and what I could start out fast and, and quick and get it done. And he came up, he's, I did, he's like, what are you good at? And I'm like, I, I like to clean. And it came in like a little joke. He's like, I start a cleaning business. And I'm like, what? And then, yeah, it took off. <laughs> Um, sorry, we keep moving the mic back and forth. So yeah, see, she's got clients bugging her now. So she's going to, I suck at editing, so I can't even edit that piece out. There we go. Um, so, so it's interesting because I think a lot of times, like women get in, get this idea that starting a business has to be this grandiose thing. And a lot of times it's not, you just fall into it. And, um, Okay, so that's a pause. I don't know what the hell I was talking about. Um, but I think it was around the fact that my mothers got me. We just okay. This is gonna be a good one. We're gonna get five stars on this one. For sure. Um, that women think that starting a business has to be this big grandiose thing, and it doesn't always like it kind of depends because I've talked to like even clients who are like, Oh, I can't do that, I can't start that. And I'm like, why? And they have this idea in their head about what starting a business means. And it's always way bigger than actually just putting one foot in front of the other. Like for you, I mean, you could have cock blocked yourself a million times into not starting it. Cause, Oh, I need this. I need a website or I need a, this, or I need cards or blah, 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 blah. When oftentimes it's just do the thing, like do one thing, get one client. And then that will start to bleed into it. So talk a little bit about when you started, what your mindset had to be to like actually do the first clean and then the second clean or were, were there parts where you're like, I can't do this. I mean, obviously knowing you the way I know you, I feel like you would just bulldoze your way through it um, and not get caught up too much in your head about it. But were there moments in the beginning where you were like, I'm either going to do it or I'm not. And then what pushed you through? I don't think I actually had the time to think about stuff mm. like that because it just, like I said, it took off. My first actual client was... <laughs> <laughs> the friend that gave me the kick in the ass. 
And um, so I just started cleaning his house on a biweekly. And then it just, it was like a rippled effect. Like it was like he, maybe he passed it along a few to a few people. Um, the father of my children passed it along to a few people. Um, and I think, and then my friends started passing it along and, and just, it was word of mouth. And, and then I just started getting the business and it came too quickly for me to sit, to get into my head. Mm. And when I did start, I was like, what the hell am I doing? Like, it is like cleaning your own home, but you're in somebody else's home and you you don't know how they clean and you don't know how they like it and whatever. So, I mean, as much as you could say, it's an easy thing to do. It is. However, people are very particular with their own home. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know if I could hire a cleaner because I'd probably go around following them being like, well, you didn't do it like that. You didn't do it like me or like, you know, and I've had some clients like that. And I tell them, you need to clean on your own because I know exactly how you are because you're like me. And right. clearly we'll never satisfy your cleaning urge or your cleaning need, right. basically, right? So I really don't think I, um, again, had the time to actually sit and think about if I'm going to make it, if I'm not, or what's the first step or whatever. And I actually just um, blew through it. Like I I sat down and, and I... And I I was very organized and what I needed and the, and I went out and got everything. And I even actually created my own brochure, like a twofold brochure. And I, I had someone to put it all together for me, but I, I made the, I did all the, all the um, different types of cleans and the costs and I did the pictures and I did, I put it all together and I was like, holy crap. I could, I've never thought that I was ever creative like that. But when you're in that moment, you're like, this is for my business and I got to do it. So I was very proud of that. I did that actually. Yeah. And it's weird because you don't, when you don't go back, um, like I, I find that women, we tend to, and it's, it's part of its conditioning, but we tend to not celebrate the little things. And I'm always saying to you, like, yeah. let's celebrate the tiniest little thing Yeah, because then it starts to prime your brain to find things to celebrate. And I think like just the fact that you said that a lot of times we don't consider like it's a brochure, but if you went and polled, you know, a hundred women in the mm -hmm. office, maybe three of them could pull it off. Mm -hmm. And you think it's no big deal because I did it. Talk a bit about like, I know that that's one of the, the biggest things for me in my entrepreneurial journey, especially in sales. Like I think everybody can sell. I mm -hmm. think everyone can build rapport as fast as me, but they can't. And I get reminded of that by people who it's not their, it's not in their nature to do that. So like when you think about something maybe that you like a skill or a gift that you have, first of all, are you comfortable recognizing the gift? First, I want to know what you think your gift is. And then the second part to that is, are you comfortable owning that gift or mm -hmm. are you still shy away from it because you think, well, it's not hard. Everybody else can do it. Of course they can do it. I think my, one of my gifts, I am not one of my gifts, you know, cause I have so many. You do. I think one of my gifts is just, um, believing in myself as much as sometimes I'm like, Kara, I know I can't do this or whatever, but I think one of my gifts is knowing I'm going to get it done. Mm. And that's like my ultimate gift. Like feeling like whatever comes my way, I'm <laughs> tearing up, shocking. Such a sap. Nope. Whatever comes my way, I'll get it done. Yeah. So I think that alone is a huge thing. Adversity, like every, there's roadblocks in every part of our lives. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, sometimes I'll cry and it's probably hitting a nerve or a trigger, but, um, I think just hurdling them, um, getting over those hurdles. I think that's a huge gift of mine. I think I've had that from a very long, it was from when I was younger, but yeah. Um, and, and just like, because I don't think like, for instance, my cleaning business, I don't think I have like a gift to clean. I'm, I think I have OCD. I haven't diagnosed, I'm diagnosing myself, but like, I don't, really think that that's a gift that I like to clean or, but I do, I do believe in a way when you think about it, because some people just don't have that, that tenacity. Exactly. And then they, they're, they just leave it or whatever. But I, like, as one of my girlfriends says, she's like, I don't know how you do it. Like you just sort of go, 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 go. You get it done. And, and, and that's partly cleaning and 
organizing. And, and I think that just, it helps me, it helps clear my mind mm. really at the end of the day. So as for the gift thing, yeah, I just think it's just my perseverance, I think mm -hmm. is, is definitely. And where do you think that comes from? Um, so just like as a sidebar, Debbie lost her mom when she was really young, like she was just barely a teenager. Yeah. And, um, and that, and I, and I talk about that a lot on this podcast because I really believe in my heart and based on all the women I've spoken to as clients or on the show who are entrepreneurs, we all, all of us come from trauma. Mm -hmm. And I think why that's important to bring up is because that trauma can make or break you. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it breaks you. Mm -hmm. And I think your tenacity and your, it's like, she is one of the most, and like, I'm going to get emotional, but she is one of the most fiercely loyal, loving women I have ever met. Thank you. She holds it fucking straight, which I appreciate obviously, because <laughs> I'm the same, but like the, there's, there's no fear. Like when you're friends with, with Debbie, there's no fear of the thing's not going to get done. Like if there's a fire and that's interesting because that's usually my role yeah. in, in a group Yeah, is don't worry. I've got it. And yeah. her and I sometimes compete for the mother hen <laughs> role, or we, I think we also pass it back and forth to mm -hmm. each other, which I think is, is telling. And it says a lot about what sisterhood is nowadays versus five years ago when people said, oh yeah, we're totally sisters, but they talk shit about each yeah. other behind the back. And I think, so it's important, I think, just to mention the fact that like, and I've talked about this a lot on the show and in all the other content, but like there is true sisterhood that happens now where calling each other out isn't a bad thing. Loving on each other, like we all, there's a, there's about 10 of us, I think. Mm -hmm. And there's a smaller group that's a bit more core, but like, you're not going to find anybody talking shit to no. e about each other. You might have the odd, oh, she was irritating this night or what, like normal shit. But, but nothing that you couldn't say to their face. Right. Exactly. And I think that's like, and the trauma piece to that is for me anyway, like I've always had this and I've talked openly about not feeling like I have a sense of belonging anywhere. And that comes from my trauma and my childhood, but your tenacity and your ability to, and the, yeah, like the perseverance, the ability to hold other people up mm -hmm. to your detriment sometimes but hold people up comes from, I believe the shit that you went through as a young kid. Yeah. So talk, I mean, and this will bleed into what uh, my favorite topic of all time is masculine feminine energy, but it it's the masculine in you. That's really created this incredible woman, but now it feels like you're starting to see, Ooh, I need to find balance. Mm -hmm. in that. So maybe talk a bit about if you're comfortable talking about when things clicked for you in, in 17, 18 year, when you felt like I really have to take the reins here. And now when you're realizing eh, maybe I need to let the reins go a little bit sometimes mm -hmm. if you're comfortable. Well, when I felt that <laughs> it's crazy because I was sitting in the hospital, my mom, when my mom was in a coma um, <clears throat> and I sat in the hospital waiting room, <laughs> again, I'm tearing up anyways. Um, and I had just, I was thinking like, shit, like she's my life. Like if she goes, cause she hadn't passed at this time. Um, she had had a heart attack, but it was, was sedated. Well, she was in a coma. Um, um, but I, I was sitting there thinking like, shit, like she's my lifeline. Like what the hell am I going to do? And I cried it out and and she did end up passing. And after that, I was like, okay, okay. Like you, you could cry it out and, and, and you're sad, but life still is living. Like you have to still live. Like, so, and I was young and I still living my dad with my dad and brother. And, and, you know, my dad and I didn't see eye to eye on that, um, on a lot of things I should say. Um, but, um, with, with that, I, you know, I ended up being on my own at the age of 17. Um, and luckily I had, uh, a, a, like a friend, um, friends, family that was able to take me in at the time. And, and, and I'm just rambling on, but it is like part of how it made me 
stronger and feel like I had to take control and be in control of, of me now. And just feeling like, I basically felt like I lost both of my parents at the same time I lost my mom. So with that being said, I, I just feel like I had no, I know I had nothing else to lean on. I had to be me one and I had to figure shit out on my own. And that's what I basically did. Um, so, sorry, we're just trying to coordinate the kids and stuff. So if it's a bit choppy today, I apologize. Um, but so at 17, trying to wrap your head around, you're basically fending for yourself. Do you feel like you ever got a chance to like be a dumb kid at that age? Or did you instantly go into adult mode? Oh, instantly adult mode. There was no more, 